to Hitler's supporters? Huh? <laughs> what, Nazi people? Uh, come on. And I, oh, I guess these people also say Breitbart wasn't assassinated, really? Yeah, he just happened to die of a heart attack the night before he was going to release an explosive secret video that he had told people was going to bring down the Obama administration. You think he really just keeled over and died from a heart attack? Mm. See, that's where that skepticism comes in again that we were talking about with John Rappaport in the previous segments. You got to be skeptical of not just government, but of everything. You should be skeptical of listening to me right now. You should be skeptical of everything you read on InfoWars. And, and you better for sure be skeptical of what you read on NPR or what you hear on NPR. Sometimes I've got family members who like to tune in to NPR sometimes when I visit them. And I, I hear it and it's just, it's just pure propaganda to me. Every, every story is spin and propaganda. I, I can't find hardly an element of truth in NPR. I don't know where they get their fictions. They, they must have some really good fiction writers in the back room that dream up their news. It's quite fascinating. In any case, we're going to go to this video where Alex Jones comments on this in his own words and brings attention to this NPR fictional weaving of the story of what happened to Andrew Breitbart and who he was as a person. Do we have that video ready? Okay, here we go. Alex Jones here with a report for InfoWars.com from my home office. Uh, on Friday, I heard this Tina Brown NPR piece when they re-aired it because I like to monitor what the uh, big uh, tax-free foundations are putting out their so-called public radio. And I actually heard Tina Brown, who's also Newsweek editor, compare, in a twisted way, Breitbart to Hitler. And of course, Breitbart is, uh, was Jewish. But the point is that she talks about writers from World War II that exposed Hitler and a book called Hitlerland about it from war correspondents and how great they were and how they were the greatest example of journalism, but then how Breitbart was the opposite of that. And, and, and before that, she'd been talking about Hitler propaganda and bad journalists for him versus good journalists. And then, oh, here's the bad guy. He's Breitbart. And I'll play a little bit of that in a minute if this audio doesn't reset like it keeps doing. But then there's this subject of the Daily Caller and others are like, oh, L.A. coroner, Breitbart died of heart failure. No foul play suspected. But then you read in to the article and you find out that it is a preliminary report, no trauma, trauma. It says no significant trauma, so I guess there might have been some. No trauma like knocked on the head. And governments and corporations have literally hundreds of chemicals that metabolize out. They can give you a poison that kills you two weeks later. My point is he was set to release documents and video that day that he said would basically bring down Obama. So that's my point on that subject. The Daily Caller's like, you know, oh, Alex Jones said it was a conspiracy. I said no one I know buys, no one I know buys you know, the story out of hand. They, everybody says it stinks to high heaven. Okay, so here's the article plugging Hitler land. Does sound like an interesting book. And then she's like, oh, the good journalists that exposed Hitler versus the bad ones. And they segue... You can go listen to the whole report at NPR, Tina Brown's uh, you know report on Hitlerland, and they segue into Breitbart, and here is that audio or part of it. More recently, it's from the New York Times by the media writer David Carr. It's called The Provocateur. That's right. Well, of course, you know, during Hitler's Germany, there were 50 foreign correspondents from America in Berlin, which is an incredible index of the golden era of journalism. What we have, of course, in the era of today with Andrew Breitbart, the blogger, the right-wing radical blogger who just recently dropped dead in the uh, early 40s, uh, was, of course, the absolute opposite. It's really the degradation, in a sense, of the Germany. Do you hear that? Who just recently dropped dead? She says that with a little bit of enjoyment. And then she just goes on to basically imply he's like Hitler. I mean, that's what this whole piece is in a very sneaky way. And, and then I was looking it up. She also compared Rick Santorum, regardless of what you think of him, to Judas Iscariot. This is the head of Newsweek. Uh, this isn't even an American, as you can hear. Nothing against folks with British accents. It's just why do they have to import all these foreigners on CNN and the rest of it to shovel us condescending know-it-all garbage. 
So she does this whole thing on bad journalists versus good journalists and Hitler and, and then, oh, then there's Breitbart. You just heard it. Realistic ideals of a William Shari. It was the absolute opposite. Breitbart didn't report anything. What really, what Breitbart did was he was a provocateur. He was a death by a thousand tweets. He, uh, you know, was quite... Oh, but you just call people Judas Iscariot. That means total betrayer of everything good. And you, you compare, uh, you know, the great journalist of World War II and say the opposite is Breitbart and he dropped dead. And she goes on and on. Um, again, we've already used a little bit of this for fair use. We could play more, but go listen to the rest of it. It is really, really sick. We to take the flying soundbite, any soundbite, and misapply it in its context and create an absolute mayhem for the person concerned, like he did for poor Shirley Sherrod, who was the obscure official in the agriculture department. And again, out of hundreds of reports, they take one where Breitbart wasn't completely correct. The truth is he broke major news, brought down Akern, brought down all the corruption with the energy garbage going on, the payoffs, and just the incredible corruption of Obama. And that's why they hate him, and that's why they demonize him. I'm not saying he was perfect. I didn't agree with him on the pro-war stuff. Uh, my point is his death was very, very suspicious, and they just go on to basically celebrate it in a piece about uh, Hitler's Germany. Just amazing, amazing. You talk about sophistic. You talk about manipulation. You talk about death by a thousand cuts. This is just death by one big cut and then celebrate the actual physical death. Alex Jones signing off for Infowars.com. Well said there by by Alex, man. Yeah, great, great analysis of that. Did you hear that voice, the, the British accent of the, the voice there from NPR? We were talking about the Hunger Games earlier, and that's how everybody speaks in the capital, the corrupt capital. May the odds be ever in your favor when they're uh, launching the games to have these children murdered for their entertainment bread and circuses. That's exactly what they sound like. Once again, the Hunger Games is real. It's happening around us right now. Just incredible. Oh, man. Uh, here's another quick quick news item for you before we go to the interview with Senator Rand Paul. That's coming up in the next segment. Breast cancer survivor handcuffed and thrown in jail over a mistaken $280 medical bill as debtors' prisons return to the U.S. This is actually from the Daily Mail, believe it or not. And here's a breast cancer survivor. Her name is Lisa Lindsay, and uh, she received this medical bill that wasn't even for her. It was another mistake. You know, you're going to get a mistake if you go to the hospital, for sure. They're going to screw up something. If not your treatment, then your billing, for sure. And so she said, I'm not going to pay it, and they threw her in jail. Took her away in handcuffs. State troopers arrived at her home. Took her away in handcuffs, and then only later was it revealed that this was not her debt. Hey, they're just stealing your babies now in hospitals and shooting them up with vaccines and throwing you in prison too. Why not just throw you in prison for other people's debt? Straight ahead, the interview with Senator Rand Paul by Alex Jones. Don't miss that. A lot of breaking information in that interview coming right up. Stay with us. We'll be right back on The Alex Jones Show on this Sunday. Welcome back to the Alex Jones Show live on this Sunday. Now we take you straight to an interview between Alex Jones and Senator Rand Paul. This is amazing. Listen in. We are joined by U.S. Senator hailing from Kentucky, Rand Paul. And the freshman senator, as everyone has noticed, has actually been fulfilling his campaign promises to try to cut government and restore our constitutional republic. And he joins us from Washington, D.C. Senator, thank you for coming on with us. Glad to be with you, Alex. There is so much to talk about, uh, but I noticed that you're uh, trying to point out that Interpol is now operating inside our country with diplomatic immunity. Yeah, I'm kind of concerned about having an international police force in our country with the ability, maybe, to extradite U.S. citizens and send them to another country. Egypt, as you know, over the last couple of months has been holding some American pro-democracy workers in their country, and they were going to try them on trumped-up political charges. And so a couple of months ago, I said, you know what, should we send $2 billion to a country that treats us this way and treats our citizens? So I tried to hold up their foreign aid, and as a consequence, I think partly of what I was doing, they released our American citizens. Then they came home, and then Secretary Clinton went ahead and released their aid. I wrote her a letter and said, you know, she shouldn't do it because 
these prosecutions were still ongoing right now in absentia. They're prosecuting them without being there. They also made the U.S. taxpayer pay a $5 million ransom for these Americans to come home, promising they would come back to to stand trial. But then this week we've learned that Egypt has asked Interpol for international warrants. They have these red-letter warrants that can be used anywhere in the world. And most people say, oh, that could never happen in America. We would never let that happen. But Interpol is doing this in other countries. Saudi Arabia asked Interpol to return a Saudi journalist from Malaysia who had said something about a, a, a Muhammad that they found offensive and they were going to accuse him of blasphemy. Interpol picked him up in Malaysia and took him back to Saudi Arabia. He will now face the death penalty for blasphemy. But the scary thing is he's being picked up by Interpol. And the scary thing is, is what kind of authority does Interpol have in the United States? And President Obama expanded their authority with an executive order in December, giving them diplomatic immunity. So all of this uh, concerns me. Senator, we also saw just last year the South African U.N. summit, and they called for a global U.N. environmental crime tribunal where you will be arrested if you deny man-made global warming. And that made headlines in Europe, but almost no news here. So they're openly calling uh, for this international power, and four of our Supreme Court justices have said that we should get our rules from the UN, not the Constitution. So I think you're right to be very concerned about this. Well, you know, one of the interactions in the last couple of weeks that was very, very telling was the interaction between Senator Sessions and Secretary Panetta in a committee in which Panetta said that if we go to war, of course, we'll consult with the UN and get their approval. And Sessions asked him, he said, well, you know, isn't there a role here under the Constitution for Congress? And Panetta basically just kept going on about NATO, the UN, and then he finally sort of said, well, yeah, we would probably inform Congress of what we're doing. But never in there was there any understanding that they had to get approval or permission from Congress. And, of course, you've spoken on the Senate floor about that, one of the few senators to actually be concerned about the Constitution being brazenly violated. And if anyone... I was confused by what the Secretary of Defense said and tries to come out and say, well, he didn't really mean that. We have the letter, as you know, last year where Obama responded to Congress with the Libya war and said, I don't need your authorization. I have the U.N. And that brings me to my next question, Senator. Uh, are you or others going to call for the House to begin impeachment investigations? I know Congressman Jones has introduced legislation that if Obama starts another war without congressional war power authorization, that they will then trigger that. Uh, but that's not moving very fast. I mean, this is this is extremely brazen, like Caesar crossing the Rubicon. If you or or your father, uh, who would get a lot more attention than Congressman Jones, were to call for impeachment uh, investigations, at least to begin hearings on impeachment. Uh, then I think that might get the executive to stop saying it follows the orders of the U.N., Senator. Well, I think the first step is to stop him in his tracks. Uh, we we tried very hard on the on the Libya motion. In fact, what we did on the Libya, when he went to war with Libya, is we introduced his own words. His words in 2007, when he ran for office, said that no president should unilaterally go to war without congressional authority, which basically just restates the Constitution. And good for him, that's what he ran on. That was part of his platform. And then he went around and did exactly the opposite when he became president. And this is not the first time a Democrat or a Republican has changed their mind once they became president. They sort of believed in limitations on the presidential power until they actually became the president. And then they believe in unlimited powers. But we will fight him tooth and nail. We fought him. We introduced his own words on the Senate floor and asked people to vote for it. But the disappointing thing was... Ten people in the U.S. Senate believe in the Constitution and believe that the Congress should have to declare war before a president goes to war. We got only ten votes, and they were all Republicans. Not one Democrat voted for the, the words of their own president when he ran for office.